Welcome to Exposure Therapy, and today my very special guest is Mr. Greg Gurley, a photographer from Alberta, Canada, and uh, thank you out there to Mr. Hale Cooper for recommending me talk to Greg. Uh, Greg, thank you so much for coming on today. I really appreciate it. Happy to be here. So uh, I, I've looked at some of your work. Uh, I'm pretty impressed. I, I really uh, grab, you know, I'm, uh, it resonates with me, your, your, your style, so I'm, I'm oh, just thanks. eager to dig into your work, but... Before we do, how did how did you get into photography in the first place? Where did when did it all start for you? Um, well, gosh, it started way back when I was born and raised in Lethbridge, and uh, you know I had always had sort of an interest in in photography. And I'm probably going <laughs> to mention a lot of things that will uh, be an example of how old I am. So, for uh, for anyone in the audience who's you know around my age, you'll understand this. Maybe other people won't, but as a kid. Um, I think my very first camera was a, a Kodak Instamatic, which took a little tiny plastic cartridge. It was a little pocket style camera that shot a film format that was called 120. And uh, so I remember that being my first camera and really sort of enjoying it as, as a young person. And uh, then I remember this would have been when I was in junior high, which is really when I got bit by the bug. And, and uh, in junior high, so grade seven, we had a shop class and the shop class had different units. So you did a unit where you built a lawnmower engine and you, you know, turned wood on a, on a lathe. And one of the units was photography where they gave you a Pentax K1000 and a roll of black and white film. And you went out and you shot the roll and then you processed it and made prints. And I can still remember uh, like it was yesterday, the very first shot I ever did with that camera and developed the film and you know put it in the in you know made a negative and in the dark room making that print and putting that sheet of, of photo paper in the tray and seeing the image come up and that was it for me i was i was bit and um have been doing it ever since um so yeah it was it was uh you know it was a really great introduction and that just something that that attached to me right off the bat What's your favorite part of that process? Like I got into photography when it was digital cameras, so I never right. went through learning the film and the process. But a lot of people that shot film say that ritual is almost like a ritual for them, that the darkroom element. So what, what part of the process is is, uh, is your favorite? Yeah, I mean, it's really funny. And, and I, you know, I really feel, uh, um, you know, lucky that I've sort of had the instruction that started analog, doing film and developing in the darkroom. And then throughout the years, transition to digital. Um, and I know that there are, even back in the day when, you know, darkroom was all there was, there were people that just didn't like it. They hated the darkroom. They hated working in the darkroom. And it was kind of the opposite for me. And I think, you know, what it was, it was just that kind of a Zen uh, sort of a space. So you imagine you go in and, of course, it's dark. The lights are, you know, the lights are off. You might have a red safe light. Um, and you typically would have water running and it's quiet and there's no phones or anything. So it was really kind of this refuge for me. And, you know, lately with, uh, you know, analog starting to, to make a bit of a comeback, mm. um, you know, there's opportunity now to, to shoot film again and to either, you know, set up a temporary dark room in your bathroom or your basement or whatever. And I still, you know, I still find that just it's a very relaxing zen peaceful place for me so i really enjoy the dark room yeah it is uh like the process of taking your photos can be a meditation and a ritual but then also the development process can be uh you know i can i can exactly see that like more so than just sitting on the computer and you know clicking yes. and sliding and stuff like it's a very That's, physically involved yeah and, and i mean even you know going back even further the process of photographing using a film camera is so different than uh digital where uh, you know, you can't see what you've got. There's no screen on the back of the camera. And, and you know, it may be hours or days before the, f the film is processed to, to reassure you that you've actually got the, f the photo that you wanted to get. And I think what's great about that is it forces you to be present with what you're doing. And that's something that I've always, you know, even in, in you know, in, lately having been a teacher telling my students who are still shoot or who have only shot digital that being present with what you're doing is still really really important 
And it's a challenge uh, uh, to do that digitally. Digital is great. I mean, everything's right there at your fingertips. It's immediate. So there's that benefit. But there's also, you know, the, 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 the trap that you can shoot without being present with what you're doing. Mm. And film forces you to, to kind of, you know, be aware of, be conscious of what you're, <laughs> what you're doing at the time. Because if you mess something up, you don't know till it's all done and finished. Is there um is there a setup either <clears throat> film or digital that you find yourself most at home with? Uh, s- s- like in terms of uh, like uh, yeah or? yeah yeah. So like not I don't mean just film versus digital, but yeah. Is there like a, a you know a body in the lens, something that is just like oh. Gre- Gre- the Greg Gerla setup? Well, um, I think I would have to say sort of my go-to lens if we talk gear, both digital and film was is, you know, a medium zoom lens that might go from 28 millimeter to 70 or 80. Um, That's the lens I use most often. Uh, It's because it does have that bit of range that gives you a lot of latitude in what you shoot. Quite often, uh, and I I have in my kit now, a, a standard lens, a 50 millimeter, if we're talking a 35 millimeter camera, so that uh, the thing about the 50 millimeter sometimes referred to as a normal lens. And the reason is because the focal length of that lens is the same as what the human eye is. Hmm. So what you're seeing through the camera is how you see biologically and how the viewers who look at the images will see. So that's often a really great uh, lens to, to go with too. But yeah, my go-to is the 2880. Amazing. What, um, what did you start off shooting and like what really pulled you in? Well, uh, if we go back to that, that unit in junior high school in grade seven, and I still remember this, out in the back of the school was uh, these set long row of bike racks where students used to park their bikes and they would put the front wheel in and they parked in from two sides. And I remember taking this shot where and this probably other people have done a shot like this where I get looking down that line of bicycles where they're sort of, it almost looks like uh, two armies that are coming together. Okay. And that was my shot. And, you know, again, from there, it just, uh, it was really, and to this day, um, anything that catches my attention and it could be the way lights hitting something. It could mm-hmm. be the shape of something. Um, it could be something that's funny or something that might be, uh, you know, a way of seeing something that isn't typical of seeing. And, and if you look on my Instagram feed, uh, you'll see I take pictures of everything, you know, from, you know, lost mittens in the grass to, to whatever it is. Um, and it can be anything. And I'm not, I, I, I usually don't go out searching for a specific thing, but just let something uh, affect me. When you're, uh, when you're up there and you're seeing something <clears throat> and having that camera at the ready to catch it, like once you get there, how do you how do you compose that shot in your mind's eye? Uh, well, quite often, uh, what happens now, and again, probably because it, it's been something I've been doing so long, it's sort of second nature to me. And and again, I often relate how to learn sort of the technical elements of photography. It's like learning a language, <clears throat> and so if you equate that to learning how to read something. Um, You know, first thing we do is we learn the letters and then we learn what each letter sounds like. And then we put the letters together and we sound out the word and then we sound out sentences. And so as a young person learning, you're almost more focused on what the words say and what the sounds do rather than what the story is. Mm. And it's sort of the same for photography. And I think starting out, you, um, you're, it's really easy to be preoccupied with those techni- technical aspects. But as you do it more, you get used to it more. Just like when you read now, you're not sounding out each letter of each word. You're just reading and you're getting what the story is telling you. Mm-hmm. And for me, photography is like that. So to start, uh, I was completely you know, consumed with the technical stuff. And the more you did it, the more it became sort of second nature. And there are times now, and I love when this happens, when I'll be out and something will catch my attention and I'll take a photo and then I go back after and I I spend more time with the photo and I see things that, um, you know, that are those great 
ways of composing something or great ways to light something that wasn't, it was almost uh, unconscious or mm. subconscious. And I just love going back and going, yeah, that's a story. That's not sounding out words. This photograph is the story. And, and that's always a, a, a fun thing for me to have happen. That's a, a really good analogy. <laughs> yeah, that's, yeah, that's really, a usable clip right there. <laughs> well, you know, good. And it, it, like I say, it's one of those things that you know. Even when I was, uh, you know, I graduated from high school and I went to art school, and really jumped in with both feet. And it was a very technical four-year program where you learn a lot about gear and lighting and technique. And there were times when uh, you would find your creativity would get overrun by the other side of your brain, which is focused on all the technical side of things. And that's okay. It's okay to do that every once in a while. Even now, I'll give myself you know, these technical exercises or challenges. But it's really important as a photographer to, at some point, let the equipment take second stage. And, and matter of fact, when I was in school, an instructor uh, told me, and this was a quote that I'll, I bring up even with, with my students and oftentimes, and he said, it's not the six inches in front of your eye that matters. It's the six inches behind your eye that matters. Mm -hmm. And I think this is really applicable even today when we've got so much uh, technology at our fingertips, mm -hmm. whether it's these great uh, phone cameras or you know, high megapixel digital cameras. I mean, there's so much technology out there but again, they're all just tools. And when you put less attention onto those things and more attention onto what it is you want to say in the photo, I always find the, the photos are stronger. They're more appealing. Philosophical question for you. Oh, okay. You're talking about the kind of six inches behind your head there yeah. or behind your eye rather. Yeah. Um, how do you feel or think um, photographers will fare as we move into this uncharted territory with AI generated oh, images, how good. important is the human element? And like, how, how do you think this is going to kind of all even out in the wash at the end? Well, that's a great question. And, and I know AI was really interesting. And, and uh, matter of fact, I tried it out where you submit a bunch of uh, uh, headshots and you let the machine recreate you as a cartoon character, or a hero figure. Um, and I remember I did, I did one and I posted it and, and one of my friends who's, who follows me is an illustrator and he just, he responded with a rolled eye emoji uh, because I can see how it can be kind of frustrating for these digital artists, illustrators who've gone and taken so much time and effort to be able to create something. And here's a computer program that does it at the blink of an eye. Mm. And I always equate that. Uh, well, you know, not always, but as I was thinking about that, I thought about Photoshop and, you know, when Photoshop came out, um, it was difficult for a lot of photographers because suddenly it, it made uh, a lot of process really easy and at a lot more people's fingertips. Um, and that's okay. I think it's a great thing. Same with, you know, the, the, the cameras that are, are in our phones now are so good that anybody has that technology at their fingertips. Um, but that's just part of the equation. Um, you can have all that technology and it's still so important. It's crucial to tie it to something else. So with AI, just like with Photoshop, you know, there was, I think when it first came out, there was, everybody was doing all these uh, crazy effects and this massive manipulation. And uh, what happens is the pendulum starts to come back because people realize that there's um, maybe surface uh, interest to an image like that. But is there depth to the image? Is there does it does the image have something beyond those immediate visual things that can appeal long term? And again, you know, I, you think about storytelling and how storytelling is so important, and it's really what we're about creatively, whether it's writing or painting or taking photographs. We're telling stories, mm. you know. Thousands of years ago, people sat around a campfire and that's what they did. They told stories. And the fact that that way of giving a message is still with us tells us how important the story component is to how we express ourselves. And a photo is no different. It has to have 
uh, in my opinion, it has to have a depth to it. It has to have something else that will keep engaging the viewer beyond just that split second. Awesome. You uh, <clears throat> you you uh, submitted a bunch of images for this yeah. episode to chat about, and uh, they do look like they have some great stories. And it was funny when we were ordering them out. Uh, the one that I picked to go first is also the one that you picked to go first. So I, I'm going to bring this one up. Yes, this is a photo that I did, and um, it's a very early photograph. I took this when I was in grade 11. So again, let's uh, age myself. That would have been about 1980, 1981. I went on a school trip uh, to Vibi, France. Um, and while we were there, we went to the Vibi War, Memor War Memorial. Uh, it was sort of memorializing uh, both world wars and Canada's part in that. And I had with me, I still remember my Pentax K1000 film camera. And uh, it was a kind of a gloomy day. And you walk down this long uh, pathway to this statue that's on this ridge. And it's massive. And when you walk up onto the platform surrounding these two big pillars are all of these statues. Um, and each denote a different element or theme. And they've got to be eight or nine feet tall. And as I'm walking around, this dark cloud just sort of comes over top of, of this area that we're in, this dark rain cloud. And uh, there had been a bit of rain, so you see the marble is kind of shiny. And the, the uh, figure, in this case, symbolizes defeat. Um, you know, she, she, the figure's holding a dagger, and her head is down, and she's shrouded. And at that same time, this dark cloud just comes over the entire memorial and it became for me a, a wonderful shot because of those elements. Um, and to this day, it's still one of my favorite pictures that I've ever done. And it was one of the first. I have that in common with you with a couple of the ones, you know, from my early days before I knew anything about anything. And, uh, you know, I don't know if I just got lucky or if there was an intuitive no of this, this is the image. Yeah. But yeah, there's there's some of those from back in the day that certainly have that uh, personal value. Right. Yeah. So that that was that shot for me, and and still to this day, I have a copy of it hanging in my house here. Oh, amazing! Yeah, it's a beautiful yeah. image. I really oh, like thank that. Thank you. Thanks. Uh, you said some commercial images. So you, how, like, I don't know. Some some photographers maybe they have their camera with them everywhere they go. Some they stays in the case till they go to whatever job yeah. the thing is. And yeah, we, we all kind of are, are different, you know, different people. Yeah. But uh, I guess what's your balance between personal work and uh, you know paid work, commercial work? Oh, yeah, this is a great question. It, it sort of uh, you know sort of tracks along with you know my career trajectory, if you will. So again, a bit of history. Um, I, when I graduated high school, I came up to Calgary and ended up going to, at that time, called the Alberta College of Art. Now it's the uh, Alberta University of the Arts. And I took the photo program there, and it was a four-year program. <clears throat> graduated, um, assisted for about a year and a half or so, and then started my own commercial studio. And uh, at that time, um, that would have been early 1990. Uh, you know, things were great. And, it, you know, I was in the big city and uh, business was good and, and shooting quite a bit. And it was a thrill. And it was a thrill, you know, from day one in what I shot and didn't, you know, at that time, it often didn't matter what the budget was or what the subject was. There was nothing better than seeing the image that you did up on a billboard or in the pages of a magazine. Um, and the, that was what was gratifying was uh, being published and, and being hired and being paid to do something that you liked. And, um, of course, as that trajectory increases, it plateaus at a point and you get to a point where the work is good um, and it's challenging and it's, you know, it, it, it pays your bills, it pays your rent, but you find, or at least I found, that in a way I was, it was becoming... Uh, too e not easy but just a, a usual and i was mm. sort of losing that that kind of that element of passion that i had at the beginning and i think that for a lot of people is a, a trigger for burnout right mm. 
Um, and it either they stop doing it or they end up getting bitter about it or what have you. And, and for me, I was lucky enough to go, you know what? I'm going to go back to uh, shooting a lot for myself. And so that's what I did. I went back and, and while still running the commercial studio, started to do my own shots. And, you know, it could be going out on a photo stroll, as I would say, or maybe uh, working with different uh, models and, on creative stuff to change up my portfolio. But just something that was for myself and had no other uh, requirements in terms of this is where you put the person and the logo goes up here. It was just shooting what I wanted to. And it was a great mm -hmm. chance to experiment because, uh, you know, there was no huge risk if it didn't work out, but it gave you a chance to have some fun. And so for me, um, you know, getting up to that point when I was in the, you know, that apex, that career was moving upward. I didn't take pictures unless I was hired to do and I was happy to, to take them when I was hired to do them. Mm -hmm. And then it, it changed and, and got to the point where I would make uh, specific either days or periods of time where I could do photography just for myself. Um, and then again, with, you know, with the, uh, the phone that you end up getting on your camera. Now mm -hmm. it's, it's at my fingertips the, anytime that I'm up and, and moving around and I take it, I have this phone with me everywhere. And what happens with the phone is, um, you know, you're there, you can see some, you get great pictures, but it also helps to uh, be a lead to what might be further projects. Mm. Or, um, you know, you see something, maybe it's a subject or a type of light that you go, wow, that's really great. I want to play around more with that. So then you can go get your other equipment if you want to shoot, you know, digital or, or what have you and, and, and uh, you know, play with it a bit more. So... I went from not you know, taking my camera with me unless I was working to having a camera with me all the time. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And I like it better this way. I like having the camera with me all the time. Yeah. <laughs> sure. Yeah. Today's episode is brought to you by Prairie View Photo Tours. Prairie View Photo Tours invites photographers of all levels to book their all-inclusive, authentic Alberta adventure at pvphototours.com. You talk about that the commercial work. I was just thinking, you know, you said your work being up there on billboards. Yeah. And like if you're if you're a celebrity, like I'll pick on Brad Pitt, for example. If you're yeah. Brad Pitt, you're on a billboard, well, that's Brad Pitt. And everywhere you go, hey, there's Brad Pitt. But you feel like you're in on a little inside secret, you know, like you get that your works, you're like, hey, that's my yeah. commercial work up there, but nobody knows who you are. It's like a little, yeah. you know, yeah, little secret I, pleasure. <laughs> absolutely. Yeah, absolutely. And there's just something about it. And and, you know, I, my parents had always been really supportive of what I wanted to do growing up. But I remember my dad, when I went to art school, you know, asking the question, well, what, you know, how is this going to be a job? How are you going to do this? How is it going to pay? You know, all those really practical questions. And, um, and I really had a, a difficult time telling him why this was a real career. And, and it wasn't until I had done a, a job I think it was for a magazine out of Toronto, a business magazine, where I got to do the photographs for an article and taking it to him and saying, look, this is what I did. And, and there's my name in the little gutter of the magazine. And I think it was at that point where he went, oh, oh, yeah, OK, this is this is a viable thing. And, you know, one of the things about and again, generally speaking, I think artists have this really it's this really ironic mix of needing to show what we do to exhibit our work, photos, paintings, music, but also being so emotional about it. That, <laughs> you, know, you know, it's basically our hearts on our sleeve. So it's this very vulnerable point of, of you know, taking a risk to putting out there, but not being able to help ourselves because we want to <laughs> show people what we do. And uh, it's a, it's a very interesting mix. So yeah, it's uh you know, it's uh, certainly not in the lines of, of being a celebrity, but maybe just a little bit that you can tell your friends or show your parents, hey, here's what I did. And, and a lot of people get to see it. And that's a bit of a kick. Hey, uh, you just uh, triggered my memory there when you're talking about that kind of need and desire to show your work. Yeah. Uh, what are your feelings on the whole uh, Vivian Meyer kind of collection? Oh. I love that story. Um, yeah. And I remember somebody sending me the clip to one of the original 
uh, news segments that it started on. And this is, of course, back, this is a few years ago. And, and I, it intrigued me. And so I started following the story um, and, you know, subsequently seeing the documentary. And for those people who are listening or watching, maybe don't know, it was this, this woman, a nanny in the, you know, the 40s and 50s who, when she took her, her, the kids that she was looking out for, out for walks, she also took pictures and she shot amazing amount number of shots that were lost to in a, in a cupboard or a storage room that some guy found. And, and the pictures are remarkably good. And so him trying to piece together who did these photographs and what was the story? The story was that she did this and nobody ever saw them. And there were boxes full of rolls of film that she had taken that had never even been developed. And um, matter of fact, I think there's a documentary out. Uh, who is Vivian Meyer or Vivian Meyer? Sorry, finding finding, finding Vivian, Vivian Meyer. Meyer. Yeah. So I encourage everybody to watch that. But remarkable. And again, it's the, uh, it, you know, a, a really interesting story. And here was this woman who, it was almost an extension of who she was, but nobody knew. And, and she didn't, obviously didn't care if anybody knew. Um, and yeah, I just, oh, that's a great story. I love it. And uh, you're right. Like I, I saw her work and fell in love with it. One of my favorite photographers of all time still to this yeah. day. Agreed. Yeah. And she, and she, you know, yes, she was a nanny or yes, she was, uh, but she was a better photographer, but only everyone mostly knew her as, as being a nanny. And, and it's so great that her work was rediscovered and, and given the, the attention that I think it deserves. Yeah. Awesome. Um, all right. Uh, so I'm going to uh, just bring up some of your commercial work here. Yeah. And uh, I'd love to hear some of the stories behind some of these because these yes. are, these are great. Yes, this is this is a work from a couple years ago for the Alberta Teachers Association, and it was uh, the ad agency was Tag here in Calgary, and uh, we went up to Edmonton where they uh, were doing a TV commercial and had wanted a uh, a still component of the work done as well, and again, this is sort of a situation where, you know, a lot of times either the the campaign suffers or the photograph suffers. Maybe it's a minimal part of the shot or what have you, but I really liked this whole project because um, it was uh, the strength was on the photo had so much to do with the entire campaign. Mm. And uh, so we went up there, we photographed probably, Oh, I don't know. It was maybe eight or 10 young people um, for these. And, and these were models. These were just kids that they, that they brought in. Um, and it was a great campaign. I really enjoyed it. So this was one of my favorites for sure. Who um, who came up with the concept for this campaign? Was it is it your concept, or did they say here's the idea and you're just the shooter? Yes, yeah. And that, you know, this is a good question because uh, you know there's this sort of uh, uh, I don't know blending of creativity both from the ad agency and also the photographer. And in this case, the tagline, the face of education. The campaign idea, the concept was all uh, done by the art director, the creative director at the ad agency. Um, and then I was able to come in and, and you know, do the do the photographic portion. Um, now, of course, there's still uh, a lot required from the photographer, even if you're not a part of the creative campaign in how to support that campaign with right. the imagery. Um, and so, you know, a lot of discussion prior to you know, actually shooting and how we wanted to do it and how we wanted to photograph it. And, and um, you know, a key component here is, uh, of course, that, you know, the story that's coming from the kids' expressions. Yeah. And, you know, uh, as skillful as the creative is on the tagline and, and, the, and the, the composition and, and the layout and everything, without a great face, um, it wouldn't be as strong as it could be and that's where the responsibility of the photographer comes in so i'm proud of this because i think um all of those elements work together to make a made a, a quite a good campaign i thought no I, I know you you just said like you didn't we're responsible for the creative aspect of this in terms of like the whole story and everything but um in black and white my question is is you do you have do you gravitate more towards the black and white or to color 
Uh, it really, I think it really depends specifically on the shot. But generally speaking, uh, I think uh, black and white tends to grab people's attention more. And the reason I think that is because every day we see everything in color. It's how we live our lives. Biologically, our eyes are, are built to, to record color. So when we see something that typically we would view in color, but it's not color, it tends to grab our attention a little bit more. Um, photographically speaking, when you take the color out of an image, it has to sit and function on light, composition, those sorts of things. The color can't carry the shot. And so I find too with black and white that sometimes it's it forces you to be a little bit more disciplined in paying attention to those crucial sort of foundation elements of a good photograph. Um, so yeah, I, I'm, I've always been drawn to black and white, a good awesome. black and white. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. Like that, that, that's just, I'm attracted to contrast. So black and white yes. is like the most pure form of that. <laughs> absolutely. Yeah, absolutely. Awesome. But, uh, there is uh, some amazing color shots you sent me. Sure. And this is definitely one of them. Oh, yeah. I love this. Yeah. I, I love this because uh, having dabbled in various types of photography, for me, the most challenging type of photography is product photography. Oh, yes. Super detailed. Um, you know, it's one of those things where the purpose of the image um, isn't to entertain, not necessarily primarily to tell a story, although mm -hmm. it, it should in some respects. The purpose is to sell something, a, a, yeah. a product. Um, so how do you make a photograph that's going to sell that image? And, you know, this was a good shot because, of course, it's a ice cold bottle of Perrier. So you've got the ice and you've got that citrus element in there. You know, uh, we with this bottle, if you, you know, if you're shooting in the studio, you take your bottle and, and this, you know, one of the secrets are you give it a really thin, thin coat of Vaseline. And then you take a spray bottle with a little bit of water and a little bit of glycerin, which is like a, a oil, and you spritz the bottle, the, the, the drops of water bead up on the bottle to make it look like it's super chilled. Um, and, you know, part of it is just facade, but the idea is to, to create a reaction. And that's what I like about this shot is that it does that. And a lot of times product shots are uh, people can really... Uh, inspect them and that's why you want to make sure that you've got the best you know all those details looked after you know is the you know is the bottle lit properly is the label lit properly you know in this case the you know the label perrier is actually foil so it's very reflective so you want to make sure you don't have any you know foil reflections that are just bright white hot spots um again one of the great things about shots like this is that it challenges you technically and, uh, you know, how do you, you know, um, part of what I've always said is that making a photograph, especially a product shot, is just overcoming a whole series of challenges. Hmm. Um, and if you approach it as that uh, kind of process, you just accomplish all of these uh, tasks to solve these solutions and you're left with a good shot. And, and you know, a great shot that's, uh, you know, conveys its excuse me, conveys its message quickly um, and effectively in the terms, you know, in terms of advertising. Well, that's, that's a win-win. Yeah. You know, I love that. And uh, no pun intended with the ice, but it's like tip of the iceberg, right? You're looking <laughs> at this image yeah. and you don't see the hours of labor that went into it's, just creating this one shot. I always say it would be <laughs> great for a lot of these shots. If, if the, the, you know, the consumer or the viewer could actually be able to, push the image back and see everything around it to see all of the different things that are set in, you know, so we've lit, you know, I've got a light table lit from underneath and there's ice on top of it. And there's, you know, big plastic underneath to collect the melting ice water. You know, there's little um, gobos or, or shades to block light in some areas and little bits of mirror to bounce light into other areas. Um, and it's just all outside the frame, <laughs> which I love. There's, um, when I first uh, started, when I first started with photography, of course, I went to YouTube to learn a lot of everything. Yeah. And uh, the one uh, channel I watched was uh, Carl Taylor Photography, and he does a really good job of uh, like showing you kind of the behind the scenes in the studio of doing these product shots and how he yeah. got them. 
And uh, it just blows my mind to set up so much work goes into product photography. It's crazy. It, you know, it's great. And it's sort of, you know, I've in the past have shot both tabletop product stuff like this and also, you know, person fashion or corporate work. And they're just both such different processes. You know, mm -hmm. the, the tabletop product is very uh, methodical and, and minuscule and you're working with little bits and pieces here and there and you're taking your time to do it. And working with people is quite a bit different. It's very off the cuff and you're trying to capture a moment that's very, you know, perhaps unrehearsed and, and two very different processes, but um, both equally enjoyable for me. Awesome. Yeah, a lot, a lot of uh, product, like a lot of const construction goes on, right? Like It's true. Like yeah, it's, it's really funny. And I know we, we shared studio space and there's a Calgary photographer named Jean Perron who I used to just, you know, he, he specialized in tabletop mm -hmm. product stuff. And I could just, if I wasn't busy, I could just sit in the studio and watch him work because the way he put things together um, was amazing. He was, you know, I, I, I always tell my students, you know, you're, you're majoring in photography, but you're minoring in engineering. <laughs> and yeah. you're also, you know, in the terms of people stuff, you're minoring in, in psychology and having to establish that connection with the subject. So yeah, it's absolutely. a little, it's kind of all over the place, which is great. Keeps it interesting. Amazing. Uh, you talked about shooting people in commercial work. So let's uh, talk about this yeah. image here. Yeah. You know, and again, one of the great, you know, when I was in school, in art school, you know, I really wanted to be a fashion photographer. So, uh, um, you know, in Calgary, of course, the closest to that would be shooting for malls or things like, you know, Marks or the sport check, things like that. So I've had a great ability, a great opportunity to, to be able to do that. And this was just, a, you know, some of the samples of, of work that I sent just to show that, you know, uh, I get as much enjoyment shooting bottles of water as I do, you know, models and, and people who are, are you know, selling fashion too. The thing models, about fashion, models. <laughs> yes, exactly. <laughs> And, you know, one of the things about fashion, you know, especially editorial fashion, maybe not so much advertising like this, but editorial fashion really gives the photographer a chance to push the envelope visually. So a lot of the, you know, a lot of the work that you might see in a fashion magazine, whether it's Vogue or what have you, um, is, is, uh, tends to be a little bit more envelope pushing. And I enjoy that too. Do you, do you have, um, Sorry, you have a guest. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, it's just the UPS guy. Can I pause? Can yeah, we pause yeah, for one yeah, second? Yeah, no just yeah. one second. This is kind of funny because I had ordered the latest uh, uh, William Eggleston photo book. Oh, wow. uh, that's out and it's just arrived. So I'm going to put that aside for now. Oh, wow. um, you know, one of the other things too that's a a guilty pleasure, or perhaps it's a curse, is photo books. I love them. Oh yeah, <laughs> and, uh, yeah. So Eggleston's a, a big uh, hero of mine as well. I uh, I tried to well I didn't try I made uh, on uh, Printique which is formerly Adorama Print okay. I believe. Yeah, uh, I did a couple of photo books through them and they're beautiful oh, cool. products, but oh, they're just yeah. like one one you know one of them costs you like three hundred bucks. <laughs> yes, yeah. I mean it's really expensive to do. Yeah, yeah. but uh, so yeah. Sorry about that. <laughs> no, no worries. Um, you, you we've talked a little bit so far from you know carrying your cell phone with you everywhere as a camera to yeah. like the bits and bobs that you're trying to work on a product shoot yeah so it's from like minimalist to minimally involved i guess to like a lot of construction and, and and creation and um a lot of moving parts to a photo so where in that spectrum do you find yourself most enjoying it uh probably just taking the photo you know, there are those components and whether it's personal work or commercial work, you have pre-production, you know, planning stages, idea stages, then you have the execution of the, of the photograph and then any sort of post-production, you know, Photoshop and what have you. And I have to say for me, the, the most enjoyable part is the actual taking of the photo. Um, and I'm chuckling because I always, you know, I, I'll do pictures, you know, I go on a trip with a, you know, meet a friend and we do pictures or whatever. And then the pictures come home and they go on my hard drive and my friend's like, where are the pictures? Like, I haven't seen them. And, and that's oftentimes for me without deadlines is once the excitement of taking the shot, 
for me is done. <laughs> yeah. I'm like, okay, let's let's take a different shot rather than going and doing all the you know the post production. Maybe um, that's the secret to why Vivian Meyer never developed her work. <laughs> oh yes, that's, that could be very true. Yeah, that could be very true. Awesome. Um, I'm going to skip ahead of your commercial work here sure. um, to some of your more personal work. Yeah, and I love uh, I love these images that you you sent. So let's look at these. Thanks. Okay, so yeah, there's there's a couple of shots that I did that are of clouds, um, and for me, uh, I also am a huge fan of a of a photographer from the early 1900s named Alfred Stieglitz, and Stieglitz, uh, quite renowned and respected, and he did a whole series of photographs, body of work called the Equivalent series, and they were pictures of clouds. The reason he called them equivalent is because his desire he said was to give the viewer of the photograph this equivalent experience that he had taking the photograph and i thought that's such a great thing where you're trying to take the viewer and and make them a part of the taking of the photograph say here's what i felt when i shot it and i want you to feel that as well and so Clouds are great because they're always there. Um, they're always changing. And you basically just have to look up. And it's, a, again, a great way, even personally, to challenge your ability uh, to compose, to challenge your ability to see. Um, see, you know, what is this little bit of white up in the sky? And is it, you know, is it photographable? And how can I photograph it? And if it says something to me, how can I make it say something to a viewer. So I have, you know, these sort of ongoing projects uh, that just carry on and, and the equivalent, my equivalent are these. And again, uh, you know, I always title them in homage to Stieglitz because, you know, I just really admired that he would do something that seems so simple, but um, can be so complex. And I love that. This one has a lot of personality, I think. Yeah. You know, and it's great. And I think it's great living in, you know, Southern Alberta yeah. where, you know, our skies are amazing. I mean, maybe not today. It's kind of socked in, but we get some beautiful skies and some beautiful clouds uh, that are changing all the time. This never, uh, never gets old for me. Yeah, absolutely. No joke in all seriousness. I have traveled all over the world. I have never seen a sky, a sunset, a sunrise as beautiful as I have in Alberta. It's every day I, is a gift for these guys. Yeah, totally agree with you. Yeah. Awesome. Um, so there's a there's a photo down here, and I don't know if this is taken in Alberta or not. This looks uh, like no. it's, yeah. yeah. So, it's so this thing. is you know one of the things that you know again that I've always been interested in is is travel, um, and I think that it uh, you know photography lends itself well to somebody who likes to travel because it's the the you know, the nice thing about traveling is it brings you out of what you're used to. Mm. Uh, especially visually. So you're in a new place with new things and you, you see things in a fresh eye, if you will. Um, and one of my favorite spots to travel has been Cuba. And uh, so I shot tons of stuff in Cuba. My last trip there, this was one shot that I just really loved. And, you know, basically you can walk down a street in Havana and everywhere you look, mm -hmm. it's a beautiful photograph. And sometimes you're pleasantly surprised. And, and as I was walking down the street, there's this little sort of alleyway. You know, you poke your head in, and here was this great little yellow car with this red shroud partially covering it, but this little red tail light sticking out. Um, you know, and the, the alleyway is a bit run down, and, and, you know, it's these sort of cement and, and concrete walls and surfaces with this bright splash of red. Um, and for me, it's just this happy encounter. Um, you know, you have to be looking. You have to be able to see things. But sometimes you're just given this this gift. And, and I think I titled this photo Toro, you know, the bull. Um, uh -huh. Because it's like a, you know, this this bull going through a, a, a the red cape. Um, but yeah, just one of those shots that that sort of says, you know, there's a there's a great picture everywhere. If you look, I have a really good friend, somebody that I, I really look up to and is so talented as a photographer. His name's George Weber. And uh, I've gone to a lot of his talks and he does a lot of street photography. And 
and uh, you know, photographing uh, sort of marginalized people and what have you. Um, and he always said, you know, if you, if you, know, he always asks his subject when he meets them if he could take this, their picture, and sometimes they say no. And and he always said, and I'll never forget this. He says, "Don't worry, because just walk around the corner, and there's another photo waiting for you." And I love that, right? And and so that's what this shot for me is. You just you're walking, and you look to your left, and boom, you're just struck with just this amazing visual. That's great. That's great. Was this shot? What was this shot with? This you know, this is shot with my iPhone. Nice. Yeah, yeah. And again, like I say, you know, uh, iPhones now have capability photographically of um, doing way more than even my very first digital SLR did. I think my first digital was a Nikon. So it was 6.3 megapixel or something. And now the average, I mean, the, the phone that I have is not even the latest model. And it's, you know, I think a 14 megapixel photo. Um, but again, what this says is, is you know, the, the great thing about this shot is what it's of. And, and I was lucky enough to have a tool with me, my camera, phone, that captured it in the way that I wanted to capture it. That's a really beautiful thing that the art of photography is now um, um, accessible to everybody. Yes, yes, I love that. You know, there's people out there who who uh, will say, well, you know, it cheapens photography and it makes it less uh, important. And, you know, now anybody can be a photographer. And I think those are all, you know, it, it, the fact that everybody can be a photographer is just a great thing. Um, the important thing to remember is not every photograph is a great photograph, right? Mm -hmm. And, you know, even there's still days I'll go out and you'll take a picture and go, oh, didn't quite capture everything I needed it to, but I can, I can try, I can try again. And I love, you know, that's why I love Instagram. It's sort of this democratization of photography and, and it sort of allows anybody to be able to try to communicate with somebody else with a photograph. And mm -hmm. I think that's always a good thing. So I'm, I'm all for social media and, and iPhone cameras and all of that stuff. Just and like you said, not every photograph is a good photograph, but also yeah. just because everybody can be a photographer doesn't mean everybody will be right. right? Yeah, yeah, absolutely. And, and and I mean, it gives opportunity maybe for people to discover that that's what they want to do without having to go to shop class and take a unit in photo. They can try with their phone, and, and if it's something they enjoy, holy smokes! Well, there, there it is. You've got all you need, you've got mm -hmm. the desire, you've got the, the camera. And you've got a, a place to exhibit. And I think those are all great. Yeah, absolutely. All right. So you, you sent some uh, some black and whites here that are beautiful. And uh, I'm, I'm relatively new to Alberta. I've been here since 2021. Okay. And uh, yeah, this past, yeah uh, this past summer, I got to travel all over the province. So I was right. almost 50,000 kilometers. Wow. Uh, and I got to see the south, the northeast, the west, and yeah. all the different types of topography here. Right. And one of the most cool things here is uh, the coolies in the Badlands. And I'd love to take yeah. a look at these photos that you sure. sent. Yeah. So these these images are, are quite recent for me. Um, and it was, I mentioned, I'd been born and raised in uh, Lethbridge. And uh, my mom and my sister had stayed down there. So I would go back quite often. And then in, uh, in 2020, just sort of at the outset of COVID, uh, my mom, uh, she was getting up there in age and was starting to get a bit frail. So I was able to go back to Lethbridge and spend maybe, it was a couple of years uh, at her house helping her. And it, for me, was really great because it was like an ability for me to revisit my childhood and I remember as a as a, a a little kid, you know, maybe seven or eight years old, going down to the coolies, the river bottom, and running around and, and playing down there. And to be able to go back as an adult, uh, probably older, well, definitely older than what my mom would have been when I was that age, going back and revisiting all of these places from my childhood. And I think it's sort of this full circle thing because you know, my mom was coming to the end of her life and I was revisiting, uh, I guess, my life and the things that I'd seen. It was just really, really kind of emotional. Yeah. So 
It was a gift. Beautiful. Yeah. It's... When uh, when we were choosing where in Alberta to live, uh, I, I, I divided it by thirds by threat. <laughs> oh, yeah. <laughs> the north, you have your bears, your cougars, and your cold. Right. Yeah. Central Alberta is basically weather could take you out at any second. And then in Southern Alberta, especially in the coolies, I was told you got your rattlesnakes and your scorpions. And I don't, I don't, I don't, I don't mess with that. <laughs> yes. And, and I'm surprised, you know, as a kid, and this is, you know, back in the day when kids could just go wander around on their own, my friend and I would, you know, mom would make us a sandwich and we put it in a knapsack and we'd ride down to the river bottom and spend all day down there and we never got bit or anything. <laughs> and I guess that's just, uh, you know, we're blessed for that, but, yeah. uh, it was so, it was just an adventure as a kid and a re-adventure as an adult and as an adult having a, this method to, again, an equivalent for me to show people pictures of the coolies and, and say, this was, you know, this was an amazing place for me growing up. Beautiful. Awesome. And, uh, and it's uh, accompanied by this one here. Yes. Yeah. Same, same series, you know, not, you know, the summers I was there, I would just go down. And again, it was, it was, a uh, just a gift because every day I would ride along, you know, on my bike, I would ride along the same route and every day it was different, same spot, but every day was different. And, and, you know, the sky and the weather, uh, the light, uh, just, offered me something new every day and, and it was just really wonderful awesome um outside outside of your personal work that you're you're doing do you have other projects or or even personal projects that you have upcoming that are things that you're working on you you mentioned photo books is there is there anything like that going on well no I, you know people keep telling me put a book together put a book together so i think i might have to start considering that um february has just passed us and um, in Calgary, well, it's sort of hoping to be Alberta wide now, uh, is a thing called Exposure Photo Festival. And it's a oh. month long festival, uh, oh, wow. primarily in Calgary, where a lot of galleries get together and will exhibit photography. There's, you know, sp you know just different events related to photography. And so I, I for, for, for myself, February is a great incentive for me, again, to get that work that I've been doing and put it out where people could see. So mm. I you know had two shows this past February. They both just came down recently, uh, which is really gratifying. I'm you know getting to the point now where I'm sort of I don't know if I want to say semi-retired or 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 you know I'm just kind of enjoying life more than, <laughs> than uh, running on the the hamster wheel, but still have this great opportunity occasionally to shoot work for uh, commercial work. So. I'm just in the process of uh, planning a, a project with uh, Daughter Creative for uh, Calgary, the Arts Commons up here. So I'm excited about that and really hoping that that happens. Uh, so yeah, it's, uh, you know, there's uh, on, on Thursday, I'm going down to Lake Louise to give surprisingly a, a workshop to a group of people on iPhone photography. Oh, cool. Um, yeah, so it's, it should be a lot of fun. So I'm still, you know, I'm out there, you know, doing it and talking about it and showing it and, and occasion teaching it. And uh, it's what gets me up in the morning and I love it. Eat, sleep, shoot. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's about it. Awesome. Um, so, Greg, we have uh, we've had your website and the Instagram uh, running down yeah. there at the bottom of the Thanks. screen. Is there anywhere else that you'd like to send people to check out your work? Gosh, I mean, it's, yeah, I think, I think my most active is Instagram, which is greg.gurla. Um, and if you, you know, I always tell people, it's sort of like, that's my diary. You know, people sometimes write in a book what they did that day. Hmm. And I usually post pictures on Instagram of what I've done that day. So it can be behind the scene shots of, you know, maybe something commercial that I've been working on um, or just something that I saw on my walk, or maybe I'm posting pictures from my travels. Um, but yeah, it's, uh, if you follow me, I'll follow you back. And, uh, like I say, it's, it's, that's the social part of social media that I really love. Awesome. Greg, I, I really appreciate you coming on today. I really appreciate your insights. Oh, and, uh, I think, uh, yeah, I think it was great. I'm excited to get, uh, get your episode uploaded there and get your, uh, get your stuff out there. So I appreciate well, you coming on. 
and uh, thank you, thank you again. Great. Well, thank you so much. I appreciate the the call and the the great questions, and it fires me up again when we talk awesome. about this stuff. I love it. So awesome. great. Thanks so much. Awesome. We'll chat soon. Okay. Take care. Uh -huh.